Aha. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Barbara Slavin. Uh, I'm in charge of the Future of Iran Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And I'm really delighted um, that we are going to be able to present some very interesting uh, poll results to you today. Um, these were, uh, this was a poll that was done uh, by the Center for International and Security Studies at Maryland uh, in Tehran. Uh, and it was done in December after our election. So I think it measures Iranian attitudes toward the uh, nuclear agreement that went into impl implementation a year ago. And it also uh, reflects Iranian uh, feelings about uh, our election and the outlook for U.S.-Iran relations under a Trump administration. Um, I want to uh, it, uh, ask those uh, here and who are watching online, if they are so inclined, you can tweet at hashtag ACIran. And we're going to begin with uh, Ibrahim Mosani, who's a research scholar at, uh, at the center. And he's also a lecturer at the University of Tehran uh, and a senior analyst at the University of Tehran Center for Public Opinion Research. He's been studying Iranian public opinion since 2006. And he and, and uh, the center at Maryland have conducted numerous surveys uh, over the years. So I think what's going to be interesting is to get his reflections on how these results compare with previous results uh, in the last couple of years. And then to act as discussants on the poll, we have two uh, great speakers. We have Sanam Naragi Anderlini. She's the co-founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network, known as ICON. She's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Um, she was also at MIT. She was the first senior expert on gender and inclusion on the UN's mediation standby team. And for nearly two decades, she's been a leading international advocate, researcher, trainer, and writer on conflict prevention and peace building. And then finally, we'll have Paul Piller, who is a non-resident senior fellow um, at the Center for Security Studies at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. He retired in 2005 from a 28 career in the US intelligence community, including serving as national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. And he is very familiar with Iran and with all of the regional developments. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask Ibrahim to come up to the podium and present the findings of his new poll. So, is this, okay, so <clears throat> the study that you're, that I'm about to present is based on a 1,000 sample a margin of error of 3.2%. We conducted the study uh, basically soon after the U.S. elections. Uh, the, we began collecting the data early December and finished it by the end of December. So. As Barbara indicated, it's uh, going to reflect a lot of the, um, many of the things that P Iranian people perhaps think about the new administration uh, is somewhat reflected here, but it's, you know, all of us are waiting to see the, what the new administration does. So the future polls perhaps are going to be even more telling. The issues that were covered in this uh, relatively short survey uh, was about the JCPOA, uh, it, uh, it's the anniversary of the implementation year uh, day. Uh, so that's included in there. there are, the poll also um, covers um, about attitudes about President Trump and about renegotiating the nuclear deal. We have uh, two very pointed uh, direct questions on that and we'll see its results. It also includes a couple of questions about Iran's involvement uh, with ISIS, and as well as I will finish the, um, the presentation with where Iranians stand as far as Rouhani, President Rouhani is concerned, and uh, you know, where, what do they think about the upcoming uh, presidential election. So first, with about the views of the nuclear deal, the nuclear deal is still, uh, has maintained its support among the public. But as you can see, uh, the trend is uh, it's definitely negative. Um, currently, 55% of the Iranians uh, approve of the deal. 
Um, but this is as compared to about 77%, 76, 70% uh, that approved of it immediately after it was signed. Now, there are multiple reasons that could be named for this drop uh, that we have covered in our previous polls. But in this poll, one trend that we see continuously is that Iranians are saying we are not seeing the benefits of this deal. 73% uh, say that their lives, the life of the ordinary Iranians, have not improved as a result of the nuclear deal as compared to the 23% who say that it has improved at least a little. Now, with this negative attitude, you might say, okay, so why did I support the deal to begin with if they're not seeing the benefits? They are still optimistic that the deal might eventually uh, uh, improve the living condition of Iranians. And in our previous polls, we see that there is a, um, there, you know, they see U.S. as being not uh, uh, being that uh, accommodating, but they hope that the Europeans and other, other world countries are going to make use of the deal to engage in Iran, and that would perhaps make uh, Iranian people's life even better. Uh, but the trend on this question is also negative as well. Uh, the, the percentage that were optimistic in our June poll were significantly higher uh, than what we are seeing here. Now, when it comes to attitudes toward the US, there is one main question, and that is whether they think the US will live up to its end of the bargain. When the deal was signed, People were divided. Uh, you know, 45% were confident that the U.S. will live up to its end of the bargain. 41% were not that confident. That the percentage of people who say they are not confident in United States living to to its end of the bargain has increased to 78%. I want you to remember this number because I'm going to come back to it. And I'm going to talk about one of its ramifications on other areas of cooperation between Iran, potential areas of cooperation between Iran and the US. But as you can see, the numbers are moving in, uh, as, I mean, people are becoming less and less confident uh, that the US will live up uh, to its end of the uh, bargain. Now, with regards to the Europeans, uh, Iranians think that uh, Europe is not moving as fast as they could to invest and engage Iran and have economic relations with Iran. And, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me first talk about this slide. So the, the, the position that, about this question, um, the, the position is that US is actively obstructing uh, sanctions relief when it comes to the JCPOA, 82%. And this is, again, about uh, significantly higher than the number that we got uh, in June. Uh, I mean, back then, again, a majority thought that US is trying to prevent normalization of Iran's trade relations with other countries. Now it's 82%, which is significantly higher than where it was in 82. Um, going to the Europeans, uh, Iranians think that Europe is not moving as rapidly, uh, that Europeans are not moving as rapidly as they can uh, to engage with Iran economically and invest in Iran. 19% uh, say that they are moving as rapid as they can, but you have 70% who say they're moving, the Europeans are moving slower than they could uh, to trade and invest in Iran. And then we had a follow-up question asking people who say uh, that uh, they are not moving as rapidly as they could. And we asked them, is it because of Iran's own weak business environment, or is it because of the pressure and fear uh, from the United States? And that number uh, is a, a large majority say it's mostly. They're not discounting the weak uh, business environment in Iran, but if they have to you know, say which is more responsible, they put the blame. Uh, uh, um, Russia, China, Germany, they are the ones who are viewed favorably by a majority. France, US, and UK are uh, basically at the bottom of the list. Interestingly, these numbers, uh, about uh, particularly for US and United Kingdom, they haven't changed much. 
uh, since our, our last round. But all of the other countries have, except Russia, all of them have declined slightly since June. So um, we can talk about why uh, that might be. So from that, let's go to uh, attitudes toward President Trump and about uh, you know, um, the idea of renegotiating the nuclear deal uh, with Iran. Um, Iranians followed the election quite closely. 74% say they very closely or somewhat closely followed the election in the US. And we have a question about, OK, do you know who they? And this is before Trump's uh, inauguration. And we asked them, can you name the new US president? And 70% you know, of Iranians could name Donald Trump as the next uh, US president. Um, and then we had another question asking, you know, how hostile or friendly do you think Obama was toward Iran? And how hostile or friendly do you think Trump will be uh, toward Iran on a scale of 0 to 10? And people would basically uh, give a score. And they expect Trump to be more hostile. But it wasn't like they thought Obama was very friendly either. Uh, there were a lot of hopes and expectations about Obama when he was elected into office. A lot of that dissipated uh, as uh, President Obama imposed uh, tougher sanctions on Iran. Uh, but they expect uh, uh, President Trump to be more hostile uh, toward Iran. And, and then we went to, uh, we asked two questions about renegotiation. We posed this introduction that, you know, as you may know, the US president uh, said that he would want to try to re renegotiate the nuclear agreement. And what do you think Iran's response should be if Trump were to say that, uh, that the US will reimpose all of the sanctions unless Iran first uh, increased the duration of the nuclear limits placed on Iran under the JCPOA? And second, we asked about well, if uh, President Trump would ask Iran to terminate its uh, nuclear enrichment program. And there were basically three response options provided for each of those uh, questions. One was that you know, Iran should accept uh, uh, Donald Trump's demand. The other one is that Iran should accept it uh, only if more incentives were provided. And the third was that Iran should not accept the demand under any uh, circumstances. And for the first one about um, extending the duration of the nuclear limits that Iran has accepted under the JCPOA, 59% reject, 30% say if we are given more incentives, uh, perhaps we should accept, and 3% say we should accept it outright without even any uh, new incentives. Now, when you ask the same thing about termination of the nuclear enrichment uh, program, that number of people who rejected increased to 70%. 21% say, you know, if you give us more incentives, perhaps we could accept. And you only have 1% who say uh, we should accept it outright. This, I mean, there, there are many reasons for why Iranians uh, might be saying that we should not consider renegotiating the agreement. Uh, but one of those reasons is not that they think that by rejecting the demands, the nuclear deal will still continue to remain in place. They don't have that confidence in the nuclear deal. In fact, when we ask them whether they think Donald Trump will, uh, how likely it is that he will decide to refuse to abide by the JCPOA agreement, you get 71% of Iranians who say it's very or somewhat likely. So they take the threat of determination of the JCPOA uh, quite seriously. In fact, they think that it is likely uh, that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump will decide to refuse to abide by the agreement. But, um, you know, and, uh, you know, while they view this, we have to remember about their attitudes toward the deal that already exists and is already in place. And what we see in a lot of the polls and a lot of the discussions we have in the focus group is that they're saying that, Look, let's make the current deal work first, and then perhaps we would think about providing more concessions. Without the current deal, uh, without feeling the benefits of the current deal, why should we uh, go ahead and provide the new US president with any new concessions? So that's basically the line of the board. Now, we ask people that there is this 
talk about what Iran should do uh, if uh, the United States were to um, basically decide to refuse to abide by the JCPOA and take actions that are contrary to the, uh, to, to the JCPOA. And there, people are divided. Uh, more people say that Iran should retaliate in that case by restarting it, the various aspects of its nuclear program. But then you have about uh, four in 10 who say that Iran should still remain uh, within the JCPOA and try to resolve this issue uh, through the UN. So we don't have a, a majority number in that case, but more people lean toward uh, retaliation. There is another area of cooperation, that, uh, that potential area of cooperation, and that's uh, the idea of uh, uh, countering ISIS and other uh, extremist groups in, in the Middle East. Now, Iranians say that Iran should increase its support of groups that are fighting uh, ISIS. 56% think that it should increase it. 29% uh, think that it should maintain it at the current level, and 10% think that, it, that Iran should decrease it. Now, when it comes to cooperation with the US, however, the numbers have been all over the place. Uh, right after the deal, there was a lot of optimism that Iran and US should and could uh, work with each other to counter ISIS. You can see the August 2015 number. That's immediately after the nuclear deal. Back then, 59% were of the opinion that now that we have resolved the nuclear issue, let's go and collaborate and cooperate in other areas, including uh, to help the government of Iraq uh, counter ISIS. That number has declined uh, to 44% now. 52% now oppose, um, uh, disapprove of Iran and the US cooperating with each other. And this is what I wanted to come back to, the effect of having confidence in the US shows itself quite well in this poll. When we look at the people who oppose and the people who approve, we come across this number that 87% of people who have confidence in the US to live up to its end of the bargain, 87% of them say that Iran and US should collaborate as compared to 16% who lack that confidence. So they're saying, you know, we already tried collaborating, working with the US on the nuclear issue. We are not receiving the benefits. The US is actively obstructive. Why should we collaborate with the US in other areas? But then when you look at the people who have that confidence for whatever the reason, 87% of them say that Iran and the US should collaborate uh, with each other in Iraq to help counter ISIS. So we see one uh, ramification of that lack of confidence uh, that, uh, that is developing in the US. Now, the other set of questions we asked were about the election and where Rouhani stands. As you can see, with the nuclear deal, uh, with people uh, losing hope or becoming less um, optimistic about the future of the nuclear deal, it has its effects on President Rouhani as well. And that's what we, we see in these results as well. So one of the things we ask, uh, and you can see why the JCPOA is so important. One of the things we ask about President Rouhani, open-ended, no options were provided. We ask people to name the most important accomplishment that he has had during his tenure in office. Now, 32% say they don't know, 17% uh, say nothing. And then among the everything else that is named, JCPOA stands out quite significantly relative to everything else. 25% uh, outright name the nuclear, achieving the nuclear deal as the most important accomplishment of President Rouhani. And with the perceptions of the deal declining and people feeling that you know, if people's economic conditions are not improving, that is taking a toll on, on President uh, Rouhani as well. Um, but you know, that put aside, there's another thing that is happening, uh, and which is connected, which people thought that you know, the deal is going to fix, and that was the economy. Right now, 64% of the population think that the economy is actually bad, relative to 35% who think that the economy is good. But more important than this, because you know, um, it, it's a view people have about the future. What will happen if we continue down the path uh, that we are in right now. And 
51% think that the economy is getting worse. This is for the first time since our polls show uh, since the time of the election up until now, where a majority of people expect the future to be even worse, that they say that things are getting, are not, not only they're not improving, uh, but that they're getting worse. This is 51% uh, who, 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 who have that opinion as compared to 42% who think that the economy is getting better. Now, the effect of that is that Rouhani's popularity uh, is on the decline. Now, one thing I want to you know, say here is that what we see in our polls when we do the analysis, the very favorable numbers are a lot more important than the somewhat favorable numbers. When you look at the people who say somewhat favorable, it's a mishmash of a wide variety of people who don't want to express negative things about Rouhani, but don't want to give him the full approval either. People who actually have a somewhat favorable view of him, and people who don't have any opinions and they say, you know, oh well, you know, instead of saying something bad, I'll just uh, pick the middle response. But the number that is really that of Rouhani's, I mean, these are the actual supporters of President Rouhani, are the people who say they are very favorable of him. And that number, as you can see, uh, before the nuclear deal, it was around 51%, quite close to the number of votes he got in the election. With the nuclear deal, it went up to 61%, and now it's down to uh, 28%. That said, among uh, various other politicians that we have um, uh, evaluated, his position is not that bad. Uh, in fact, his best, um, you know, th the thing that is helping him the most is that he doesn't have any serious challengers going forward to the uh, upcoming election. When we compare uh, various different politicians, I mean, with the exception of Qasem Soleimani, who is way up there, uh, Rouhani does fairly better than everybody else. Now, below that list, we have other we, um, we have evaluated other politicians as well, and their way, uh, their position is much lower than that of uh, Rouhani. With this in mind, we have asked a couple of questions about the upcoming election of who people would vote if Rouhani was competing against Ghalibov, if Rouhani was competing against uh, Jalili. We asked the question about who do you think his main uh, opponent uh, or the main challenger would be in the upcoming election. To that question, vast majority say we don't know who his main challenger will be. So that's a good thing for Rouhani. People don't, cannot name on top of their head a, a real challenger for him. But when we put him next to familiar names like Ghalibov, for example, he, he does fairly well. Uh, uh, I mean, his numbers have declined when we compare him to his votes to that of uh, Ghalibov. In June, 54% said that they would vote for Rouhani, 30% said that they would vote for Ghalibov. In December, uh, in our current poll, that 54% had dropped to 49%, so below the 50% mark. And Ghalibov's number had gone up uh, two percentage points. When we compare the other politicians, we see the same trend. that. Rouhani's numbers are dropping, but it doesn't mean that the, the opponent's numbers are increasing. A lot of people are waiting to see who the main uh, contender and challenger will be. And the last question that we have in this poll, we asked them, okay, what do you want the next president to focus on? What should be the, the main focus of the next president? And you can see unemployment uh, in general and youth unemployment uh, coming second are the things that people want the next president of Iran uh, to address the most. Everything else is secondary. Thank you. Okay, Ibrahim, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm usually skeptical of polls, and we've had our own experiences in this country with polls that, where they've turned out not to be terribly accurate. But this one made sense to me, <laughs> uh, uh, given what I know about Iran and, and uh, the views of, of the nuclear agreement. I wanted to ask you one question first um, that actually comes from Twitter. I had a question about whether these, uh, these polls were conducted with cell phones or landlines. 
And I believe you said it was landlines. <laughs> so I guess right. the question is, can you get a fair sampling that way, given that most Iranians um, uh, communicate on cell phones? Right. Most Iranians do communicate on cell phones, but they have a landline in their homes as well, unlike many people in the US. And most people do pick up the phone in their home when it rings. We don't have telemarketing in Iran, so that helps. Uh, so when people receive a call, it's either a prank call or a serious call. And all you need to do is to convince them that this is a serious research that you're conducting, that this is not prank. Once you move over that hurdle, uh, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, the poll starts. In the US, the response rate usually is around like 13%. In Iran, we experience somewhere around 80% Why is of that? response Why is that? rate. Uh, People, first of all, when you call people, and you can try it yourself, uh, I mean, for people who speak Farsi, uh, people want to express their opinions. Uh, they're quite opinionated. Uh, not only they give their response options, usually they justify their response options. They have opinions about the question that, you know, it would be better for you to ask it that way instead of this way. So that's why usually polls, uh, when, we, uh, when we design like 20 minute the questionnaire, it usually takes around 40, 45 minutes to complete um, because people have all these opinions. You cannot tell them to quiet down. They want to. So no, it's actually when you, if you listen on these interviews, it's quite an engaging process. And I uh, recommend anyone here who speaks for C to exercise that. You know, just pick up the phone, dial a number, random number, and start talking. And they'll talk to you. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, my own experience as a journalist in Iran, it's one of the easier countries in the world to conduct interviews. So I, I would vouch for that. So Nam, I wanted to get your your uh, your reaction to the poll numbers, um, whether they make sense to you as well, and 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 uh, what do you think that they they bode for U.S.-Iran relations going forward? So I just wanted to echo that I was I'm, I'm always very skeptical of, of these because I you know in general I think at least. The previous generations of Iranians were, were very uh, cautious about speaking on the phone and, and being honest. But 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 to me, they 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 seem to really reflect uh, the sentiment that we hear, whether it's anecdotally or otherwise. Um, so so I want to congratulate you on that. And I, I and I agree with you. I think Iranians are it's kind of a post democratic society. Everybody can be everybody thinks they can be president. Everybody thinks they can be a pollster. Everybody has an opinion about about what you should do in life and, and so forth. So so it's, it's quite it's quite fun to to, to hear you to, uh, mention that. Um, I think, I mean, to me, the, the issue that we're looking at here is, number one, um, the JCPOA, uh, you know, as, as, as it was said, there was optimism, then people have not seen the benefits, they have not seen the benefits of sanction relief, because frankly, as much as Iran has been living up to its end of the bargain, the United States hasn't. And that's the part of the conversation that was really not um, articulated well here in the U.S. It was always, you know, we've asked, that we've told the Iranians they should do X, well, Y, and let Z. Let me stop you there. I mean, the State Department people will tell you that all the sanctions they said would be lifted were lifted. Um, that, in fact, uh, John Kerry went around the world and people from the Treasury Department went around the world telling foreign banks it's okay to do business in Iran. And they say, well, you know, you can't force banks to get involved. Mm -hmm. They had their own concerns. They were they were mm -hmm. apprehensive about our election. They didn't exactly. know what was going to happen here. So, uh, you know, in fairness, but, I mean, the Iranians think that the United States actually there was one one statistic you didn't mention. I think it was something like fifty one percent said that um, they believe the United States had had actually lifted the sanctions as required under the JCPOA. But then this much larger number thought the U.S. was using other means to discourage that's foreigners from doing business. Right. So it, maybe that's what you that's, mean, I mean. Because it, technically, the U.S. did fulfill well, its obligations. Well, I mean, I, th I think I think it's important first of all to figure out when we say technically, on what level. But mm -hmm. but sec if you take the banking sanctions, for example, you know when they impose the banking banking sanctions, the the instructions to banks around the world in terms of. Um, going way beyond actually what the sanctions imposed, because because they were banks were informing ind individual Iranian citizens to come and close their accounts. That was not part of the sanctions at all, right? But it was the fear. It was it was going up above and beyond what the sanctions had imposed. And so the question then is, if you're a bank and you may face billion dollar fines, how? Uh, willing are you to now just you know remove and continue business because because actually the message from the U.S. has been 
pretty mixed. And, my, I, and I think that the, the issue of the word and the spirit is important because you had, um, at the end of last year, we, we, all, we had a whole new ba batch of sanctions. They weren't related to the JCPOA necessarily, but it goes against the spirit of saying, we're trying to you know, move beyond one issue and open the space for ongoing negotiations, but meanwhile, we're getting more obstacles. So it's a question of trust more than anything else. It's just, do we trust the counterpart? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, and, I, and I think that's, that's really where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, I, I wanted you to talk about this just in, in, in a sort of broader strategic sense. We're, we're at, an, uh, obviously, a point of change in this country. We don't know what the policies of the new administration are going to be. Uh, toward the Middle East. We've heard that the priority is going to be fighting ISIS, um, but President uh, Trump has also criticized the Iran deal and suggested he could have negotiated a far better one. Um, so when you look at the, the feelings in Iran about the nuclear deal, uh, about the United States, about the reliability of the United States, how do you think that all, all plays into what emerging U.S. policy could be? Well, I think the, the two basic points to make with regard to that set of questions, Barbara, is are, number one, the ball's in the U.S. court as far as the JCPOA and its future are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, if we had a companion briefing about compliance on the other side, we'd hear about the IEA certification of compliance and so on, but this is about uh, opinion on the Iranian side. And number two, that the JCPOA is central to the future of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the very... Um, uh, indicative slides is the one that Ibrahim put up, which uh, correlated or, or cross-tabbed, tabulated the confidence or lack thereof in adherence to the JCPOA with the willingness to collaborate with the United States on things like cooperation with ISIS. ISIS. Uh, so whether or not uh, we or the Trump administration or anyone else on this side sees that agreement as central, certainly the Iranians do. And I would, I would echo what both you and Sanam commented about, you know, the, the results seem reasonable. Um, and authentic in, in a couple of senses. One, you know, they are very reflective of what the Iranian leadership is saying on things like renegotiation and the mm -hmm. centrality of the agreement and so on, uh, as well as expressing unease about what is seen as U.S. not complying with at least the spirit of the agreement. Uh, but also, it, it does reflect, I think, um, a very realistic view of what's going on here in Washington. Just as uh, Ibrahim's data showed that uh, a lot of them followed the election, you know, they also, I, I dare say, follow, or it's easy for them to uh, follow the press reporting on uh, what's being said on the Hill right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a response uh, on a question like uh, the U.S. Uh, seems to be trying to, or we expect they will find other labels under which to reimpose sanctions that supposedly were taken off of nuclear sanctions. That's being talked about right now on the Hill, a lot. Yeah. Uh, and moves are being made in terms of legislation being introduced. So it's a very realistic view. But just one last comment on, in terms of the, the larger picture. Um, th there are the contrasts between the United States and the Europeans, or the, or the rest of the P5 plus one, uh, with regard to willingness to cooperate on things like ISIS. But coupled with that, and, and I don't think Ibrahim put this slide up, but it was part of the data, was, it was a question about uh, basically, uh, do we have a clash of civilizations here, or is it, is it, or is it possible for those of us in the Islamic world to get along with the Western world? I can't remember the exact wording, but it was along those lines. And, and the, the, the basic response of the majority was, no, we don't have a clash of civilizations. It is possible for uh, the Judeo-Christian West to cooperate with those of us in the Islamic world. But again, it goes back to things like, is the, is the United States going to comply with this agreement? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the Iranian leadership oversold the agreement. I think we would yeah. all agree uh, in order to get popular support for the JCPOA while the negotiations were going on. And it's interesting, you know, you hear people here say that the U.S. gave up too much. Well, of course, there are many in Iran who think that Iran gave up too much mm -hmm. and, you know, gave, conceded too many centrifuges and accepted too many uh, restrictions. Uh, when it has taken so much time for people to begin to see the fruits of the deal, I think it was sort of inevitable that, that a certain buyer's remorse would, would come in in Iran. Uh, I heard at an event I was at earlier today, Gary Seymour was speaking, and he was a former official of ours dealing with Iran, that May 18th is a key date. That is when the administration must next uh, waive uh, a series of, of sanctions uh, involving Iran's oil uh, exports. So um, the new administration has until May 18th to, to make up its mind, I guess, on whether it's going to continue to uh, comply with the agreement. 
uh, or not. If the U.S. does not waive those sanctions, I think it's the State Department that has to waive them. If the U.S. does not, then the U.S. will be in, in uh, violation of, of the JCPOA. And that would be literally days before the Iran's election. And <laughs> Iran's election is May 19th. Right. <laughs> so if you want to have an impact on Iranian voting, right. there's a way to do it, uh, for, for better or worse. That's going to be a very, very uh, interesting couple of days, I think, as, as, as we see how we move forward on this. Um, Ibrahim, I want to again go back to this whole question of you, you say people are happy to talk on the phone and so on. Um, I think it's interesting that you pointed out the distinction between those who feel very strongly and somewhat strongly. Uh, because as you, as you mentioned when we were talking earlier, there's an Iranian tradition of taruf, of excessive politeness, where you don't always exactly say what you mean. And you add to that, I would think, legitimate concerns that somebody might be listening in, somebody from the government might be listening in. Um, to what extent do you think that, that skews the results? I mean, are people really as anti-American, for example, as they say in these polls? And they're always yeah. anti-American in the polls. All right. So let's start with your last question first. Yes. Um, they have different, I mean, when you look at the polls, you have to look at them in totality. Uh, we presented some of the data here. We've been collecting data for quite a long time, asking various different questions. And mind you, they have, they, they tried right after Obama was elected. They tried right after the JCP to find something that they would like about the U.S. as far as Iran-U.S. relations are concerned. Now, there is a lot they like about the U.S. in terms of U.S. technology, uh, you know, U.S. dollar, uh, but in terms of education. Educational system, right, right. Educational system, you know, all of those are things. And when you go to Iran, when you hear positive things about the U.S., that's what they're expressing, that U.S. has a very good educational system, that U.S. economy seems to be working better than ours. But that doesn't mean that they forget about all of the sanctions, support of Saddam Hussein, and everything else that is in their mind mm -hmm. uh, the, about the U.S.-Iran relations. It hasn't been a very friendly relationship. Um, so that's when you see the negative numbers. When we ask about the American people, those numbers flip. Sure. Um, it is their opinion about the U.S. policies toward Iran, and you know they can't find any positive things about U.S. policy toward Iran uh, for the past uh, even ever. With the, even with the JCPOA? With the JCPOA, the numbers actually improved. With the JCPOA, the numbers improved. With Obama's election early on, the numbers improved, then it went sour again. And a lot of those improvements was because they were expecting things to become better, and then they didn't. And th they have gone through that process quite a few times, uh, <laughs> where they think now it's the time, and then they're uh, you know, they get dashed expectations. Uh, and one of the other problems is that on a lot of those instances, we see people on the Iranian side who are, who are, um, who are suggesting that Iran should be more accommodative, that we should build common ground. They oftentimes oversell the achievements that they're about to attain. Right. And hence, when things don't work the way they were telling people, you know, things become even worse. Now, on the issue of uh, the excessive politeness uh, factor, that's, we see that in all, every country has their own unique way of how people respond. And that's why when you read these numbers, you have to have that sense, that local knowledge, to kind of really understand what these numbers are telling you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I, for example, emphasize that don't combine the somewhat and very favorables. These are two different types of people. We look down. When we do a lot of the statistical analyses of these polls, we look at the people who are saying particular things and how they have responded to other questions to see you know, what is it really mm -hmm. that they're telling us here. That's why when you read uh, the same thing with the US as well, when you read the poll numbers, you have to have that sense of the, you know, the US polity and how people react. And in terms of people being sensitive about um, someone listening in on the interviews, Honestly, we haven't seen that in our, in our discussions. Now, I, I totally agree that there are, uh, there are people who might have that fear. But to say that, it's, uh, for example, we did an analysis of, uh, we went through one of our polls and picked out the questions, the, the responses that went at odds with the official response. Mm -hmm. And looked at the percentage of people who at least selected one or two responses 
that were at odds, totally at odds with the official response. And you get the number like around 70, 80 percent of people <laughs> who at least select one or two responses that sure. are in direct divergence with that of the yeah. and official you, stated And policy. you don't you don't poll about the supreme leader. You're, you know some right. things are off the table, right? right? right. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, if you want to, uh, well, actually, go ahead. Let me uh, get a microphone to you. Do we have a microphone? If you want to have an interjection here before we get into the formal Q&A. Thanks. And uh, introduce yourself, if you would. Um, I'm Clay Ramsey, Program for Public Consultation. But I only meant to act as sort of the, the, um, the, the Q person at the bottom of the stage in the little hole. Um, the finding about uh, willingness for Iran to resume diplomatic relations with the U.S. might be a good example mm -hmm. of uh, willingness to say something right. um, that is might seem untoward. I don't. Have you polled on that in the yes. past? I think you have actually, yes. but not in this yes. particular. No, point. no. We have asked about whether Iran and U.S. should engage in this whole range of things, and people are quite open to it. People yes. explicitly say that yes. But that doesn't mean that they trust the U.S. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they like the U.S. Uh, in terms of U.S. policies toward Iran. Uh, a lot of those positive, I mean, uh, their openness toward having more, uh, you know, people-to-people uh, -people contacts, government-to-government -government contacts, government and, uh, you know, U.S. government and Iranian government collaborating on a lot of things, uh, you know. Uh, people, we, we actually asked the question on whether Iran and U.S. should strive to make their relationship better, and the vast majority of people say yes. Um, and JCPOA was that opening, was sure. where people were going to test whether providing U.S. with concessions was going to make U.S. more accommodating. And what they're getting back, what they're hearing back, what they're experiencing is that, no, when you give something to the U.S., uh, you know, you have to wait a long time before U.S. Mm -hmm. reciprocates mm -hmm. in kind. Yeah. So now my, my own experience in, in going to Iran is that the, the, the sort of positive feeling about the United States shifted very sharply in about 2012 when the worst of the sanctions starting to hit. Uh, people were having trouble buying medicine and uh, a lot of uh, essentials weren't, weren't coming through, even though they were technically not blocked by the sanctions because of the banking difficulties. People could not not get these these things, and so that to me would account for the the, the more negative feeling to the, toward the United States. I'm wondering, um, and I'll ask Ibrahim and, and and Paul as well, why Russia is suddenly so popular in in Iran. That I thought that was an interesting finding, given the historic divisions between Russia and Iran. Before before I answer that, I, one of the things that I think we have to be very careful about is not falling into the clash of civilizations discourse, because. You know, when you think about Iran, when I think about Iran and as an Iranian, I'm like, we have Christians, we have Jews, there are synagogues still there, there are Baha'is, there are Zoroastrians, there are all sorts of people, a huge diversity of ethnicities, mm -hmm. and, and very, very widely connected to the world beyond. And this notion of trying to say, you know, they're, you know we're Judeo-Christian, they're Muslim, they're different, we're, it, it, this black and white, this is incredibly dangerous and it's self-fulfilling. So, so I think that, that's one thing that has to be very clearly put on the table, and with the visa issue, Yes. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's saying, are we saying Muslim countries? Are we saying specific countries? Are we then saying Iranian Baha'is as well as Iran? I mean, all these things have to be addressed here. And, and it's, it's, I think that, that's, that's one thing that, that we should be careful about. In terms of the, the sanctions question, you know, part of, part of the problem that we have is that we're sort of sitting in the present. And the past is consistently also present in different ways, whether it's 1953, whether it's 1979, whether it's the bombing of the Iranian airline, whether it's, you know, what these things are all there. And, and it's not really part of it. They're ghosts that are present, but nobody's talking about them, right? And, and, not, and, and I think that until there is a willingness on both sides to actually address some of those things, um, and on, on both sides have some form of apology, on both sides, right, for, for some of these things. Um, it's going to be very hard to move to the future. Having said that, from a strategic, rational standpoint, because that, that's almost emotional, you know, it, it's, but from a strategic, rational standpoint, sitting here in the United States, looking at that region, and thinking, what did 15, literally since 1994, when we started imposing the oil and gas sanctions and then, and then ratcheting it up, um, what did sanctions achieve? What did it actually, where did it take us, right, in terms of, Ultimately, there was the nuclear program happened. We had to negotiate. Um, it's, 
it, so sitting now looking five years beyond, what do we want, what do we want it to look like in five years time or 10 years time? Iran is a country of 70 million plus people, predominantly young, moderate, educated, it's a bulwark on the borders between, with Afghanistan and Pakistan where you have Taliban and you have nuclear weapons. You have, they are fighting Daesh, whether, you know, they, that In they Mosul, are, yeah. you know, it's, and, and we can have all sorts of, you know, there are all sorts of issues domestically and all sorts of issues uh, internationally. But the question of assuming that we can squeeze the country or squeeze the public into some kind of chaos, or I, I'm not sure, I'm, I have no idea what the Trump administration is thinking about, but, but it's, it seems to me that the JCPOA was the starting point of something to move us towards the future where it would be a more peaceful future and a more moderate kind of engagement and rational engagement than just sitting and, and, and thinking that, that, you know, this is, you know, they are evil and, and, um, and it, it, it's just kind of doesn't, it, it's a cognitive dissonance in, yeah. in a sense. Let me go, first Ibrahim and then Paul. The, the, the numbers for Russia and China are both positive. And, um, you know, again, that's, is it just because of disappointment with the United States that there was a feeling there could have been more with the US and now they're pessimistic about the outlook and so they're looking looking to Russia and China. Um, I would recommend, by the way, on our website today, there's a blog post on our Iran Insight blog uh, written by Ivy Yang, a, a young intern here, on Chinese-Iranian relations, which basically says that if, the, if there's not an improvement in relations between um, Iran and the United States, uh, Iran is going to look more and more toward China in particular, which is already Iran's biggest trading partner. And you know, if the JCPOA falls apart, uh, the Chinese are still going to be trading uh, with Iran, most likely, and probably the Russians as well. But, but how did you see that in, in the conversations you had with people? Why the positive view of Russia and China? So the, the less negative <laughs> views of uh, China and Russia, yes, there were majorities saying that they have at least somewhat of a favorable view, but there are a lot of other countries out there that people have positive, more positive views toward as well. Uh, we only gauge the P5 plus one countries, and relative to those, uh, China and Russia stand out. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I think it's because of the engagements that China and Russia have had on various levels with Iran. I mean, uh, one thing that uh, China was known for prior, to, let's say, if you go back five, six years ago, it was basically uh, goods that were not of high quality. Yeah. So if, uh, you know, yeah. to be Chinese was, was bad. But now one thing that China has done, China has moved into Iran, has made investments. China is importing cars into Iran that are of good quality at a lower cost relative to, uh, relative to the European cars. So if you want to move up from the Iranian-made cars to, to, to another level, to a higher Chinese. level, you go Chinese. What brands? Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are quite a few, actually. Cherry is one of the brands that, are, that, that is, uh, uh, Lifan is another one. There are, there are, Mm -hmm. Quite a few brands. They look really good. They look European, but they're Chinese, and the the quality of the goods have been improving as well. One mm -hmm. of the, for example, uh, when uh, initially smartphone was, you know, if you wanted to have a smartphone, it was Apple. Mm -hmm. Now it's Huawei. You know, it's the Chinese uh, cell phones are you know are of cheap are, are cheaper and of basically of the same quality, and they, they are doing a lot of the a lot of the productions are happening jointly with Iran. It's not a pure import. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they are not, you know, so that has positive effects. Mm -hmm. uh, they are hearing less negative things about China. That's another important thing. And when you uh, look at various news sources that, uh, that is available to them, uh, from, name it, from BBC to all the way to the Persian uh, media, they don't hear much negative things about China. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has an effect there. On the Russia, it has been Iran's main partner in fighting what Iranians see as a source of threat yeah. to their security. If there is one thing that Iranians really cherish is the security that they enjoy in a very tumultuous you know, area. Uh, the fact, I mean, previously Turkey used to be a country that some of the uh, you know, more, more liberal segment of the society would look at and say, you know, we want our country to look like Turkey. Yeah, now they they're do. saying we don't want our country to look like <laughs> Turkey. And that's why you see the numbers of 
Qasem Soleimani all the way up there because he is credited with keeping Iran safe, with preventing the bombings that are happening in Turkey, a country that a lot of Iranians used to visit uh, uh, to have fun. Uh, you know, the fact that they're not happening in Iran, he is, uh, he is credited for it. So, and Russia comes into that game as well. So if, obviously there, there's probably a lot more issues involved, but these are the things that we can uh, ascertain from the polls. Yeah, Paul, do you have anything to say about the, the well, Russian numbers? Well, I think quite simply it's a matter of uh, things that are more recent and have a material effect on Iranians and Iranians' lives trump the you know, historical enmities and rivalries. And I think Ibrahim covered uh, most of that. You know, it's not China or, uh, or Russia that's uh, been going out of its way over the last several years to try to impose unilateral sanctions that really right. hurt. It's not China or Russia uh, that has used a grip on the international banking system to try to have secondary effects that also hurt the Iranian economy, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the, the Russians have uh, uh, been a lot more forthcoming with assistance on things like nuclear reactors than the United States has been on things like airplane spare parts. I mean, it just goes on and on. So it's much more, you know, the, the material, more recent policies than it is Either, either the historical rivalries or more ideological things. Mm -hmm. I, I think the only possible exception to that is, you know, I expect you know, some Iranian hardliners, you know, they, they do look to China in particular as, as a kind of model of how to have economic uh, uh, vitality and tremendous growth while still keeping a grip on things politically and not, not opening up politically. And of course, as, as Cho and Lai said about the uh, French Revolution, it's still too early to see whether that's, <laughs> that's gonna work in the long run. Um, but that's th those are the, th the reasons. Yeah, and and also apparently uh, uh, Iran is very important in the Chinese One Belt One Road uh, strategy oh, as sure, well. Yeah. Um, so it's part of, of the the sort of Chinese reentry into into the Middle East as well as the Russian reentry into. The yeah, and also yeah. the Russian and especially the Chinese don't have these nagging uh, questions about human rights. Human rights. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I, I I think there's a other dimension which is worth maybe next poll. Because you know the economics is one side, or even the politics, if you want. But there's the socio-cultural aspects. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, I, I'm wondering if you did a poll of Iranians and said, do you want, you know, do you have affinity with Russian, with Russia, or with China, or with the West? Which way it would go? So, so that that's one thing. And then to ask about other countries. You know, so it, you know, you had you had Germany was favorable, Sweden, Italy. You know, th there are these other places that that people have gone. They have family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then what the other trend that we've seen over the last, uh, I think, 15, 20 years is of, of students going east. Right. So going to India, going to Malaysia, going in that direction as opposed to coming west. And that's going to have its, also it's going to have its Im implications and impact in terms of the kind of affinities and, and, and which direction people are looking at for, for mm -hmm. business. And, and, yeah. and We have, I think, about 12,000 Iranians studying in the United mm -hmm. States right now, though, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a, a number, it went down under Ahmadinejad, and then it's, it, once he was out, it started going sort of straight up, yeah. so that's been yeah. a big increase. Okay, your turn. Gentleman in the back, wait for a microphone, say your name. Uh, my name is Arash uh, from GW, GW University. First, I want to thank you because of your polls, conducting these kind of polls and publishing the results. You are doing a great job, thank you. Uh, my question is regarding the President's Rouhani job approval. The charts that showed us, it's about his favorability, and we know that job approval is much more important and typically is less than the favorability. Do you have any idea about, uh, did you ask some question about his job approval? And my second question is, you ranked uh, some of the figures in Iran based on their uh, favorability, the Khasim, Khasim Soleimani ranked first and then others. Did you take out the, those who didn't have any answer, they don't know, they didn't know him or the other options, and then record the result based on those who have a, any idea of whether they agree or disagree with them? Good. Thank you. Shall I? Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, with regards to your first question, not in this poll, but in the previous poll we have asked about, and in other polls that I've conducted, we do ask about the job approval, and we go by detail, actually. We say, how is he doing with the economy? How is he doing on civil rights? How is he doing? Uh, and basically, uh, on when it comes to the economy, which people uh, mostly focus on when they want to give the job approval, uh, he's not doing that great. Uh, on foreign policy, he gets a very high approval 
rating when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, but when it comes to the economy, and particularly for creating jobs, uh, his ranking is, 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 is quite low. Now, on the popularity of various Iranian figures, what I had up there were people who are commonly known. Uh, and one of the reasons I did not have the rest of the individuals in there is that there are a lot of uh, in the, uh, politicians in Iran who are not well known uh, by a large majority of the population. And if you just look at the approval ratings, it might be misleading because you think that if, the, if you're not approving, then you must, you must be disapproving, where in fact, they just, they just don't, don't know. know they, just, they just don't know who that individual is. But in, these, uh, in the numbers that I showed, all of them had an, uh, 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 you know, the, the percentage of people who did not know them were below 5%. So it's basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right here in the middle. Um, again, thank you very much for coming. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that in Iran, would probably move towards China or, or Russia. How do you see uh, Iran moving toward the EU? Because uh, from what I remember in 2003, uh, President Rouhani at the time said that our policy at the time was to move to EU to make sure that you know, EU doesn't stand with the US in basically any potential co uh, confrontation. Thank you. I did not say that Iran is moving toward these. Uh, there were the other discussing. I was talking about why people have a less negative view towards them as compared to uh, United Kingdom and, and United States. Um, but what we see in the polls is that people do look forward to having a better relationship with Europe. They, in fact, one of the things that, that is keeping up the support for the JCPOA is the hope that at least Europe will have an open hand to, to, to engage with Iran and for Iran to, to engage with Europe. And the, what makes them even more angry toward the US is because they feel that Europe wants to engage in Iran, but it does not out of the fear of the United States. So that's another source of uh, grievance that they uh, thought the JCPOA will solve, which apparently, it, I mean, from their point of view, it has not. Mm, okay, Ed, right there. My, na <clears throat> my name is Ed Martin, and I want to thank you for this really uh, very informative presentation. And just ask: Is is this available in some uh, publication form that we it's can online. get a hold of? Yeah, well, uh, we should have the link up on our website, and I also wrote a story about it for El Monitor, and the link is up there as well. So you okay, can, you can go to. And then it. just a couple comments. I was in Iran in uh, the latter part of November, early December, and before I went, an Iranian friend of mine here said, one, well, he said, expect a million questions about the election. And so I was, in, I was really surprised. We didn't get that many questions about the election. Hmm. May have been because many of the people we were interacting with were religious scholars and maybe weren't so interested. But, the, but we, some comments that really surprised me, there were, this is re really very anecdotal, but a number of positive comments about the fact that Trump was elected. So mm -hmm. I think I, the only thing I could imagine is maybe that reflected a very negative view of Hillary. Of Hillary. <laughs> That's the only thing. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't really ask about an individual American candidates, did you? But again, uh, during the election, I think it, I absolutely agree. A lot of my friends in Iran were very, very suspicious of Hillary and thought that she was uh, going to be very detrimental for U.S.-Iran interests. And they thought that Trump, as a business person, would actually be more pragmatic. So I don't know how that factors in. And there was this feeling uh, that, I mean, you have, you have two groups of people, people who think U.S. is going to be intrinsically hostile toward Iran, and the sense was strategic, that Hillary, if she is going to be hostile, and she is going to be able to get other countries to be hostile against Iran as well, to create that international Consensus. You know, consensus against Iran, whereas they thought that you know Trump is going to be hostile, but, but probably, <laughs> uh, you know, it won't. It will just isolate it, itself in the U.S. in the process of trying to. But that aside, what we see in the numbers here, uh, when we compare Trump and Obama, you know, you cannot be further apart. You know, the, the it's views toward it's not that different. They, they don't. They view U.S. as an entity first, and then 
you know, those people who are a little bit more sophisticated might be able to delve into the politics here. But it's also, I think, um, that there are such high expectations of Obama, yeah. right? No, Whereas, yeah, you know, you yeah. start with low expectations of, of, of perhaps, you know, with, with the new administration, and then, you know, then, then you're, so, so there's also that issue of, yeah. of how ho hopeful people, I mean, remember Obama, I mean, it, right, you know, right, it, was, right. it, was, it was incredibly uh, powerful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, here, Harlan. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Uh, what are the attitudes of most Iranians towards the Ayatollah and the clericocracy, and how much stability do you think there is uh, in the near and long term? And you didn't talk anything about the Arab world and attitudes, especially towards Saudi Arabia, but the wars in Syria and Yemen. Could you comment on the whole panel, comment on those two issues, please? Well, you didn't ask about uh, the theocracy because I think that would have been an incredibly sensitive political we have question, asked right? In, both the, in from the past? Yes, we have asked both, not about uh, the supreme leader, but we have asked about uh, both from within Iran and calling into Iran. Uh, the first time we asked was in 2009, uh, where, where we asked about uh, the role of uh, religion and whether, uh, you know, the, whether Iranian policymakers should uh, take religious teachings into account. We have asked it multiple times afterward as well. And there is that sense that, you know, the, Islam is part of our culture and we want that to be reflected in how uh, the country uh, uh, is governed. Um, there is this, uh, about, what was the second question? I've... Oh, yeah, so views toward the Saudis are even more negative than views toward the U.S. It take it took a you know it, it went down quite rapidly uh, after particularly after the uh, the the deaths of Iranian pilgrims in in Saudi Arabia, uh, and from that point on, it's it's just on a downward trajectory. Um, I mean, it, it's much lower than it is much higher. Negative views toward Saudi Arabia is much higher than there are views toward the U.S. And we have asked about, for example, um, the um, what gave rise to ISIS. And the two things that come up is basically Saudi Arabia and Wahhabism. Mm -hmm. These are the two things that are most named when, when you talk about ISIS and where it comes from. Um, and then there is the you know, geopolitics and U.S. comes in and all that, but Saudi Arabia and Wahhabism are the two things. Uh, views of the U.S. because insofar as any U.S. administration is seen as tilting heavily toward the rival on the southern side of the Gulf, that's that's a negative in Iranian eyes. But it's also, I think, I, um, I, I, for, for the blog, I did a piece on this. Um, the whole notion of uh, sectarianism, Shia, Sunni sectarianism, which has been the discourse here and the narrative that have, that in, in a sense the Saudis have, have also promoted here. It's such a false narrative because in the, in the if we think about Muslims globally, only 13 to 15 percent right. um, identify as Shia and even then it's a variety, it's, a, it's very diverse kind of within that. The vast majority are Sunni and what's been happening, actually, and this is this is, I think, the frustration that you you often see from the Iranians, or, or generally speaking, um, when 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 these issues are raised, is that Wahhabism has been spreading and making itself the mainstream Sunni sort of identity, and and it's almost like stealth sectarianism. It's actually spreading across <coughs> Sunni populations across the world, um, and and there's no way that that the minority Shia population and or Iran, which is also culturally and linguistically very different to the Arab world and everywhere else, that it's, it's going to you know, have that kind of, a, a kind of a force in a sense. So, so it, it's, a, it's a very, um, it's, again, it's a false narrative that, that has been spread and has become normalized here. And, and it actually, you know, th there, there are issues well, that need to be- Well, part of Wahhabism is a, is, a, is a disdain stronger than that for Shiism, which, that, is, not that's even, for sure. which is not even considered but, Islam yeah, but, by but, some. But Wahhabism, what, that used to be such a narrow slice of the Sunni world, has become so normalized. Now, that, that's what, you know, you go to Sri Lanka and, and there's Wahhabis, and you go to India and there's Wahhabis. Bangladesh. In a bang, you know, this, 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 these places didn't, Pakistan didn't used to have Wahhabism, and it's, and, and it's now as if it was born, you know, I mean, people just, it's gone socioculturally as opposed to, um, it's, it's not just, it's soft power that's been used by, by the Saudis as well. 
Greg Thielman, board member of the Arms Control Association. The Trump administration seems to be on a trajectory to move the U.S. Embassy uh, to Jerusalem, uh, to uh, remove its resistance uh, to settlements in the West Bank. Um, will this have any effect on Iranian attitudes to the U.S., or is it marginal? It's pretty marginal. My the Iranian public? Yeah, they don't care, do they? Or will they care? I mean, we haven't they, asked, so I wouldn't be able to say. I, my, my guess is they, they would, the Iranians would take some cues from Palestinian behavior, and uh, just as they've said on a lot of other final settlement issues, you know, if it's good enough for the Palestinians, it's good enough for us. So, uh, you know, if, if there were, say, an uprising in the West Bank or something, you would hear a lot of at least vocal support from the, from the, from the Iranians. If, if it's, eh, well, then I don't think you'd hear, hear very it'd, much. It'd be a good propaganda point for the yeah, Iranians, sure. for sure. And they would play it uh, heavily, I'm sure, in uh, Friday prayers, right? Yeah. Uh, this guy right here. Wait for a microphone. Uh, thank you, Dave Rubinowitz. Uh, poll results very often depend at least as much on the actual wording of the questions, the order of the questions, and in telephone polls especially, the exact script that's used, the voice of the interviewer and all that. And I'm just, uh, it depends as much on that as on actual opinions. Sometimes it depends more on that than on the opinions. I'm wondering when you have a series of polls like you did, do you try to keep the same questions in the same order so that the two are actually comparable, or do things change each time? That's a good question. So when we want to be able to compare questions, we do exactly what you say. Because yes, all of those could have effects. Uh, the, uh, the classic, I mean, just to give uh, an example uh, to what you were saying, you know, the classic uh, story is that you know you would ask uh, during the Cold War, you would ask Americans, should should uh, U.S. journalists be able to go to Russia to interview to see what's happening there? People, vast majority, would say yes. Mm -hmm. And then if you follow that question with the question about should the Russians, should the Soviets be able to come? Now they have said yes about the U.S. and they say yeah, we guess so. But turn it around. And before asking about the Soviets, ask about whether this, before asking about the, the Americans, Americans, ask, about, ask the about the Russians, you know, you would get a total different number. So there are a lot of, uh, I mean, polling is not just about picking up a phone and just asking questions. There's a whole science uh, behind how to write the questionnaire, how to script it, how to implement it. And uh, if you don't apply those, you would not get the reliable numbers that we have been getting uh, the, in our poll. So a lot of the questions where things should not change, uh, we don't see any change in our, in our numbers either. I mean, they remain within the margin of error of each other, and that gives us confidence about the reliability of our results. Do you have women and men asking questions? That's a very good question. What so was we the have question? The women and men asking questions. Oh, yes. do you have women and men? Yes. Questions? So uh, it is much you get much higher response rates if you just have full female callers <laughs> in your call center <laughs> as compared to if you have uh, uh, men. Uh, so the, a, lot of the, a lot of call centers, and, and that's the case in the US as well. Yeah. It's not only limited, I mean, that's not an Iran thing. Women tend to, they sound more friendly, and they, they, they <laughs> you know, they, people, they're able to get answers from people. What you know? about the respondents? <laughs> so what we have, generally, we don't, men don't mind talking to women. women. Yeah. <laughs> but we do have some women in some parts of the country who do not want to talk to a man. Particularly, sometimes they want to talk to a man, but their husbands don't <laughs> want them to talk to a man. So in those cases, we have to change the uh, interviews. Very good. Okay. Back there, a gentleman with the curly blonde hair, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Adam Weinstein. And um, my question, and thank you for your polling and presentation. <laughs> my question is these polls were, I assume, conducted before the Plasco building disaster. Yes. And I'm wondering what effect this has had on Mayor Ghalibaf and his um, bid for the presidency, and also whether this is a win for reformists, while at the same time it sort of has overshadowed uh, Rafsanjani and the political discussion from that. So I'm wondering how you think that will influence elections. 
Those are great questions that we haven't yet evaluated. Uh, I think it could go both ways. Uh, one thing that Galibov did was that he physically went to the site and showed himself as being this active manager on the ground, a person who is not missing in action, who is uh, you know, taking direct charge of, you know, of We, we of should say this, the Plasco building was a, a, a 1960s era high rise that uh, uh, burned and collapsed in Tehran uh, a week or so the ago. The center of Tehran. Yeah, in the center of Tehran. Very shocking. Yeah. So it, we have to evaluate. At the end of the day, uh, you know, Ghalibov is trying to say that I gave the warnings. I, you know, the, I, in, I gave those warnings in writing. There were CC to parties who were responsible for coming and actually doing things. On the other hand, he is the mayor of Tehran, and this happened on his watch. So uh, it's, it's too early. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's too early to gauge, but perhaps we need to give it. Some, there's a lot of high emotions right now. I don't know if they will last up until the election. That's another thing that you have to. But we, I don't have any data to, to talk about its actual effect at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, lady right there, yeah. Hi, I'm Hope Loudon. I'm curious about the uh, cyber army in Iran. I've heard that it has one of the largest cyber armies in the world. And I'm curious what public perceptions are of internet freedom and also what implications for cybersecurity that could have for foreign investment. Hmm. It's not something you've polled on, is it? Or have you? Uh, we know. Let me tell you the numbers, and then we'll go to Paul for the right. for, for the uh, for the <laughs> rest of or to Sana. What we have asked, I mean, the, the only questions that come to my mind is that people like the internet. They they are rapidly using it. Uh, it has actually uh, the, the apps like Telegram, uh, which is the WhatsApp of that that Iranians use is more widely used than, than people use their cell phones now. And this is, and they share, I mean, if you, if you are part of these groups, the things that are shared there, the pictures, the, the stories, the leaks and whatnot, it's, it, and it, everybody has access to it, they like it, and the number of people who are using these apps uh, are just increasing. That said, uh, I don't know whether, if we haven't polled whether they are sensitive about, uh, uh, you know, whether they're, they're afraid that someone might, uh, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the cyber secure, I mean, cyber force, there, there, there are cognizant, we have asked about this, uh, about um, the, they know that Iran is, has a strong cyber, but their view is that it's directed toward outside threats as opposed to doing internal, SPN, internal uh, data gathering. But, you know, I don't know, we haven't asked enough questions for me to give you more, more Paul, of a response. you want to weigh in on that? I have nothing to add. No, I mean, uh, we've done, actually, we, we did a publication here a couple of years ago about Iran's uh, cyber arming. I think, I forget the, the, the headline of it was something uh, sort of that it was sort of in the third tier, but moving up. So, I mean, traditionally, you know, Russia, China are considered much more powerful, but, uh, but Iran, began to develop its own uh, cyber offensive capabilities after the Stuxnet virus, right. Right. Uh, right. which was a US-Israeli uh, virus that uh, slowed down the Iranian nuclear program by disabling a number of centrifuges. And that was, what, back in 2008 Eight. or 10? I have to go back and check. About 10, I think, 2010. And then after that, Iran got very active, and, and we've seen uh, attacks on American banks. We've seen attacks on the oil, uh, on Saudi Aramco. Mostly they're um, dedicated denial of service attacks, so they're, they're not that sophisticated. They just bombard various websites until they, they collapse <laughs> under the weight. Uh, but they have definitely been working, working in this area, certainly since, since 2010, uh, very intensively. Yeah, over here. Hi, I'm um, Jake Tigo, a student at American University. Diplomatic connection has never been very easy between the United States and Iran, and so it's a sort of a wider opinion that we would not have been able to reach a plan like the JCPOA without diplomatic overtures to both the US and Iran from Oman. 
especially under the rule of Sultan Qaboos, who's been a diplomatic powerhouse in the region for years. Mm -hmm. He's getting up there in age and doesn't look like he will be there much longer, and many fear that this diplomatic bridge-building Oman won't be the same without him. Do you, with your experience studying public perception in Iran, do you believe that there will be further pushes from Iran itself towards diplomacy with the United States without that kind of bridge building, or do you think it'll be much more difficult? Hmm. So th th there are aspects of the question that I'll answer and then have Maybe Paul. Uh, Paul to answer the last. Um, this JCPOA was a litmus test for a lot of Iranians to see whether they could actually engage US in a serious uh, diplomatic uh, engagement and, you know, and for the give and take to take place. The perception now is that you know, they lack the confidence. You know, they, they gave uh, a chance to this overture. They, the nuclear program in all of our polls, even in the current poll, is a cherished program. They see it as a sign of Iran's scientific development and advancement. They even gave that up, basically. Uh, the perception is that the nuclear program is, is not what it was before. To give this a chance, and the perception now is that we did everything that we should have, we did our part of the, the deal, and the other side is not reciprocating. Now that has its effects on everything else as well. We saw, I just showed you in one area where it was about the fight with ISIS, People who think it went quite well were quite supportive of that collaboration. People who thought that you know, it's not going to go well, they were not supportive of that, that collaboration. So that's going to be, I think, more determining mm -hmm. than the Sultan Qaboos, uh, what happens. It's also there. good to see that Zarif's popularity numbers are still really high, the right. foreign minister of Iran, who, of course, is so identified with the JCPOA. Yeah, I, just, I, I think it's really important also to not just think that this, you know, this attempt at the JCPOA is the litmus test came out of nowhere. Um, we have to remember that in 2001, after 9-11 and going into Afghanistan, if it hadn't been for the Iranians' support to the US in Afghanistan to go after the Taliban, things would be very, very, could have been very, very different. And what they got out of that was axis of evil. So, so it's been an ongoing, and, and you go back to the 1980s and the Iran-Iraq war and, and the attempts to get the Security Council to acknowledge that the Iraq, the Iran-Iraq war was started by, by Iraq, just that, just that acknowledgement. So, so it's really important to, to know the, that, that side of the history, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said before, that, you know, there are ghosts on both sides, and, and it, they need to be addressed. But it's the, the litmus test keeps coming, and then if there's another slap in the face, it's going to, again, take, you know, take us back many, many steps, I think. And, and, it's, and so it's really important to try and figure out how you keep the momentum going, because um, I, I just don't, you know, I'm, I'm like, in the next five years, 10 years, what is, what's the future that, that we're envisioning? And, and you certainly don't want more chaos and conflict in that area. Third party mediation by the Omanis or anyone else was a factor going back to when US and Iranian diplomats weren't even talking with each other. So it was a matter of you know, having to make contact. We're past that now, so I don't think that's gonna be the factor. Um, as Sanam just said, you know, you've, there have been opportunities to build on other endeavors where interests ran parallel and the Afghan exper Afghanistan experience uh, after 9-11 was probably the most hopeful one, albeit very briefly, until, uh, as noted, we slammed the door in their face. I mean, one could imagine um, other things. Uh, Syria immediately comes to mind, especially with uh, some of the things our new president has been saying in terms of uh, how he wants to realign uh, Syrian policy. But I think from the Iranian point of view, uh, the main response to that would be, look, we, the, you know, the centerpiece, whether you like it or not, is this nuclear agreement. And it's kind of hard to build beyond that unless we solidify that and make sure both sides are uh, upholding their end of the deal. I think it's uh, indicative perhaps of, of that uh, uh, attitude on the part of the Iranians that it was Iran uh, out of the three sponsors, the others being Turkey and Russia, who did not want the United States to participate in this mm -hmm. meeting in Astana on Syria. Um, uh, that was, uh, you know, I, I, I expect if you pin, pin down the Iranians who made that decision, it would be, uh, why should we are, go out of our way to include the, Iran, the Americans on this when they're still, they still don't seem to know what they want to do on the uh, nuclear agreement? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, I think we're going to see a lot of verbal hostility uh, expressed toward the United States in the run-up to the Iranian election, for sure, especially while the U.S. stance to, toward Iran and the JCPOA is not clear. Uh, it would make no sense for Iran to be overly solicitous of the United States, certainly not publicly. Um, you know, especially, I mean, Rouhani is going to have to sound like a hardliner, or much more like a hardliner, I think, yeah. in, in the run-up to the uh, election, not look like he's soft on, uh, on the United States. Yeah, woman here. Wait for the uh, microphone. Hi, I'm Stephanie, C Stephanie Cook with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Um, you, you probably have answered this a million times, but could you kind of uh, be a little bit more specific about exactly what in the way of sanctions, relief, the United States, the Iranians, what, what are, say, the three most pressing things that the Iranians would like to see the U.S. do in terms of unblocking the sanctions um, problem? So there is a public perception, and then there is the more sophisticated aspect, which mm -hmm. others uh, may want to comment on. From the public point of view, they want to see more jobs. And what they're saying is that uh, there is limited economic activity inside the country and a lot of it is being blamed on the sanctions. Now, they don't know the exact details of what sanction it is that is not, you know, that is preventing economic activity in the country. But at the end of the day, they will come back if they want to evaluate whether the sanctions have been lifted or not, they will evaluate it in terms of economic prosperity and economic activity inside their country. They don't know the exact details. Now, one thing they do know and they have heard about a lot are the, uh, the financial sanctions. Mm -hmm. That is something that is on people's uh, radars. People know that they cannot transact easily with other uh, countries. Even Right now, people who want to transact with countries even like China, they cannot use the normal banking system. They use the, the, money, lend, the uh, money swappers uh, in process. And that adds 3 4% on each transaction, resulting in higher costs uh, and lower mm -hmm. uh, profits. I, I mean, I would just add that from Iranian central bankers and others, I mean, the, the fact that they cannot convert foreign currencies easily. Um, for example, Iran has a large number of Omani rials, mm -hmm. and they want to convert those into euros. But to convert them into euros, it has to be calculated in dollars first. And that touches the US financial system, mm -hmm. and that is still sanctioned. Uh, Iran has a still. It actually has to go into dollars first. In it has to be calculated in dollars first before it goes into euros. Iran has billions of dollars in, in oil uh, revenues that are still bottled up in China, uh, in uh, South Korea, in, in Japan, India, Turkey. And uh, because of this problem of conversion into you know, a more convertible currency like the euro, uh, Iran is not getting full access to this money that it was promised under the JCPOA. So the United States will say, well, we did everything we, we said we would do, but the practical impact has still not been there. And do you know why? Uh, well, there, there was talk actually about you know, allowing a so-called U-turn. Up until 2008, I believe, uh, Iran had what was known as U-turn provisions, which means they could do these conversions uh, into the dollar, and the money didn't physically come to the United States or stay in the United States, but simply the calculation was made in dollars, and it passed through the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Mm -hmm. That has been uh, barred since uh, 2008, Eight. I believe. Mm -hmm. And so they have asked for that to be restored. Um, that was something that was a subject of discussion in the Obama administration, but they didn't do anything about it. And uh, now I think the prospects for that happening are frankly very, very slim. So uh, also, let's be honest, Iran has a lot of problems with its banks in terms of transparency. Uh, and uh, they're trying to address some of these problems now, but they're still on a blacklist of the, uh, what is it, FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, which is based in Paris. Some of the measures against them were suspended for a year, and they're trying to work through a process of making their banks more transparent and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, having been under sanctions for so long, people are used to doing mm -hmm. things in very convoluted ways. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, I think it's hard. They have, to, they have to come up to speed on all the new techniques that are there for evaluating financial fraud and so on. 
There's a question of you know, support for terrorism. Well, Iran gives money to Hezbollah. We call Hezbollah a terrorist organization. They don't. If money goes from their bank, banks, to Hezbollah, then that bank is going to stay on a blacklist mm -hmm. for so us. A lot of this money is still locked, sort of a lot of the money is still, is still locked the outside the country. It's been, a, it's been a very slow, slow process. And you've seen now that some mid-sized European banks mm -hmm. and Asian banks are beginning to deal with Iran now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's taken months, and uh, the very the larger banks, the big, you know, the Deutsche banks, and so on, they are not mm -hmm. touching Iran uh, at this point, and that's a source of frustration because Iran wants to do some big deals. I mean, they're buying Airbuses, Boeing's, they want to buy all kinds of new locomotives from Siemens, and do mega mega uh, uh, in deals involving their uh, petroleum industry, and they're finding it very difficult to do the financing. And, and there is another aspect of it. It's not only the buying aspect of it. The reason a lot of European companies and a lot of world companies are not investing in Iran is because they don't know how to get their money out of yeah, Iran. Right. Yeah. So if they cannot get their money out of Iran, they're not going to invest in Iran. So that's not going to happen. So it, it's, it's, it, it's both things. We have time for one more question. So this gentleman here. Thanks. Uh, Karthik Vaidyanathan, State Department. Uh, I was wondering, Ibrahim, given all the polling that you've done to speculate whether there's a floor on Rouhani, um, if perhaps you could share some stories or anecdotes recently, whether those numbers could continue to go down. And as a follow-up, if so, if it does, does that mean that the public's enthusiasm for international outreach might go down with it? Uh, we see Zarif's numbers are actually higher than uh, Rouhani's now. You mentioned approval for, for that kind of outreach is still there, but is it possible a couple years from now, if Rouhani's tenure is just seen as a big disappointment, that uh, the Supreme Leader's messaging on you know, resistance economy gains more than this idea of opening up to the world? Just, just, uh, yeah, I, I think there's, you have to make the distinction between the world and the US. US. I, d I don't think that we're going to see Iranians not wanting to engage with the world, I don't even think we're going to see Iranians not wanting to engage on, a, on you know, as education and with with the U.S. But in terms of um, the, yeah, in terms of the government and so forth, and and for example, the question, you know, the HR one five eight, the visa, the, the, the that 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 bill that imposed the the, the visa requirements for dual nationals, um, the patent, the the executive order, the, which we all have heard um, would include Iranians. These kinds of things kind of. They, they hit you on a personal level, you know. That, I mean, it hits ordinary Iranians to say, why are we being punished collectively for, you know, endlessly? And, and I think, but I don't think it's going to stop people wanting to engage. Well, they've never wanted to stop engaging with the world. It's a, that, that, that's just not part of the kind of mm -hmm. and, uh, and, guys. And Rouhani, floor? So uh, Rouhani became what he was from 5%. <laughs> so, you know, that's where he was before the election. Uh, it, not because people hated him. A lot of people just did not know him. And people who knew him had these uh, uh, you know, reservations about him, uh, going back to the 2003 to 2005 freeze of the nuclear agreement in which he was again involved and in which, again, public felt that Iran got nothing in return mm -hmm. for the concessions that Iran had made under Rouhani at that time. So I don't know if there is a floor, but I could tell you that you know prior to the election, his numbers were as low as 5%. So I don't know if that acts like it's going to act like a floor or not, but, um, but that's where things are. Now, in terms of your other question, I think while what Sanam is saying is absolutely right, Iranians, even with respect to the US, right now Iranians are saying that we should have greater trade with the US. They are not saying that we should not have trade with the US. The issue is that what kind of a president you want to have? Are you going to have a president who is going to uh, you know, stand up for Iran's right to resist foreign pressure, not cave in, not concede, not compromise, but demand for the other side to respond? You know, that's, that's where you might end up going. Now, that doesn't mean that that would mean that they don't want to deal with the, the, the world or the Europe. But it could mean that we don't want to compromise anymore for, for the, until we see signs that the other party is going to reciprocate as well. Now, 
One question we ask in this poll, uh, we ask what kind of a president, given all of the changes in the world, given the fact that you have President Trump, do you want a president who is going to focus on building common ground, uh, or do you want a president who is going to you know, stand the ground? And people are moving toward you know, standing, standing the ground. The ground. Yeah. Uh, they haven't, uh, they historically, they, don't, they cannot point to a situation, or there are very few scenarios they can point to and say, look, we made a compromise there, and it was good for Iran. Uh, and when you lack those historical experiences, it just makes it very difficult for you to say that perhaps we need to change our way of life. Maybe they'll accept us now. No. You know, it'll be that, you know, perhaps we need to stand our ground and they will be forced to accept who we are. That's an open debate in Iran. That has always been the debate in Iran's foreign policy of whether you want to be more conciliatory, more accommodating. I think it's a debate here, too. <laughs> or, or whether, you, you know, you have to force the other side to accept your demands. And which one is more practical? Unfortunately, you know, I was telling uh, Barbara this before we came here. If Rouhani, the worst case scenario, I think, here would be for Rouhani to win the election and for him to change his tone it, with respect to the approach that Iran should take toward the U.S. Because in, if that happens, then you will have no one in Iran who will vouch for a conciliatory, you know, building a common ground kind of a foreign policy. Uh, you know, at least if he loses and his sideline, at least there will be some voice, you know, left there. But if he stays in office and things Can't don't be. change and he changes, I think that would be uh, a, a very, you know, bad scenario. Okay. I want to thank you all. I want to tell you that um, on January the 30th, which is next Monday, uh, at noon, from noon to four, we're going to have uh, a whole series of panels just on the nuclear agreement and w how it's working, not working. Uh, so I really uh, would ask all of you to come if you can. We're going to delve into, into detail about the impact of the, of the JCPOA. And thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thank you.